locate Luke chapter 11. And in Luke chapter 11, where we'll be today, we're going to be covering a series of words, teachings from Jesus that would be highlighted as known as the Lord's Prayer. And as we go through this, I want us to really think about this prayer that we've heard so many times and think about how is it that we can practically apply that to our lives so that it actually makes sense. It's actually tangible for us. We use it in a way that it's not just a rote memorization. It's actually meaningful for us. To do that, though, let's just back up a little bit. So a few weeks ago, uh, we started in uh, the wilderness, and Jesus was in the wilderness, and he was tempted. Have you ever felt tempted, gone through a time of trial? Maybe you're going through a trial right now. And what he taught us is that he just asked God through that time, essentially, oh, Lord, what would you have me do? When all these things come my way, when all these opportunities come my way, when the opposition comes my way, will I be willing to say, oh, Lord, what would you have me do? Instead of doing what I would do or coming up with my own solution, will you give me the understanding of what I'll do in this tough situation? And we were just so impressed as we looked at Jesus' example that he was able to stand unwavering before all of the temptations in his world. The enemy went away. And then in chapters 4 and 5, we look at Jesus then... uh, being a leader worth following. We came up with a list of characteristics. Not only was Jesus someone who was unwavering, and he would never be drawn away from dependence into a world of independence, which is exactly what the enemy wants us to do. The enemy wants us to go into a place where we have control of our own lives, where we make our own best decisions. And he said, no, I always want to say, Lord, what would you have me do? He was a worthy leader, and we went through a list of characteristics that just satisfied Jesus uh, when we were thinking about him as to what type of leader he was. And I, and I, I feel it's important enough to go back and just be reminded of that. So just bear with me. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I have my notes here. So it said things like this. Jesus was, and if you are a skeptic, remember, if you are someone who is looking or searching, you are a detective, you're someone on the search for really finding that God in your life, that the one that loves you and the one who is worth following, well, listen about the characteristics of Jesus. He's loyal, he's knowledgeable, he's full of integrity, he's honest and gracious and able and gifted to teach. Imagine you were in an interview and someone said, I want you to, I want someone to describe you. And they were using these words to describe you. Would you hire this person? The answer is yes. If someone was compassionate, committed, entrusted with authority and power, adaptable, respected, influential, able, humble, faithful, kind, non-discriminatory, relational, wise, charismatic, and loving, and most importantly, he was a servant. He just wants to serve, as Philippians 2 pointed out so well for us. So Jesus had this list of characteristics. He was No doubt about it, a leader worth following. And so when he came to the men who were holding their nets, and he said, follow me, they had to make a choice. They had to say, what is my net worth? What is my net worth? And they had to find the value of whatever they were holding on to in this world and say, am I going to keep holding on to it or am I going to drop it and follow him? So we asked the same question of us. What is our net What is it that we are holding on to? And what is our net worth? And is it worth letting go of for Jesus? When we think of the characteristics of Jesus and the gift of what he offered to us in the great exchange, the worth of what he is offering us is found in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. What is at stake here? Us dropping whatever we're holding on to When we let it go, we receive the righteousness of God, the perfection. Instead now of God seeing us for who we are in our sin, God now, because of what Christ has done for us, looks at us as having no sin. In fact, he looks at us as if though we are Christ in purity and righteousness. That's quite an exchange. So yeah, I think Jesus is a leader worth following. And then last week we talked about The things that if Jesus is a leader worth following, what is it that Jesus was actually doing? And we came up, and again, thank you for bearing with me with this terrible analogy, but the word poems. And I said that we we, we remember it with P-A-L-M-S, and I put my poem out, and I said, he, what did he do? He prayed to the Father. He aided those in need. 
He laid down his life through sacrifice and service. He made, oh, sorry, he made disciples, and then he, he saved the gospel, which is terrible. But then I thought since then, and there are lots of ways we could do it, I thought he stayed true to the gospel. He stayed true to the gospel. He stayed true to the word. He never wavered, especially when it came to his opponents. He knew the gospel so well. He knew the word of God so well that he was able to come back at people who had an opposition to the word, and he was able to speak the truth in love, but truth. And so we're called to do the very same thing, and that's why it's palms. So we are to model. We are to pray to the Father. We are to aid those who are in need. We are to lay down our life, just as it calls us to. When we lay down our life, it says that's when we actually find our life. We are to make disciples, as the Great Commission the great commandment tells us to go in all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son, sorry, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That Spirit, He's going to be with us forever when we do that. And then finally, that we are to also know the Word and speak the Word in love in the face of the opposition. We are called to do the same thing. In 1 Peter 4.10, it actually says we are to serve in any way possible. Each of you should use whatever gift you have to serve others. So we see that Jesus is unwavering in his allegiance. He is a leader worth following. We found out what he did. And now as disciples, just as these disciples will, we're going to step into what is it that we actually do next. We want to learn more. And when we want to learn more, what do we do? We ask questions. We ask good questions. Do you know that there's only one thing that's recorded in the scriptures that the disciples, it says, ask Jesus to teach them? And it was to pray. Teach us how to pray. Uh, I don't know if you have the capacity to put the scripture back up. It doesn't matter. I'm going to read it through, though, from Luke chapter 11. One day, Jesus was praying. So what was he doing? He was modeling prayer. It was important to him. And that's what a good leader does. He models or she models exactly what they want others who are watching or listening to do. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. What they saw was that there was a correlation between the exceptional nature of God and his prayer life. They said, whatever you're doing, and we're not even sure all all about you yet, Jesus. We're still learning. We're following you. We're learning. We're getting to know you more. We think we're pretty sure that you're set apart and something special about you, and we think that prayer has something to do with it. Will you teach us how to pray? It goes on to say, just as John taught his disciples. At that time, it wasn't uncommon for groups to have their own prayer, a prayer that would unify that group. It would be signatory of that group. So Judaism would have a prayer or a series of prayer. It it very much is clear that John taught his disciples how to pray, so he had his prayer. And now they want to know, Jesus, what's your prayer? We want to be united with you. We want a prayer that unites us. Will you teach us how to pray? And I think that this prayer should unite all of us as well. Now, we call it the Lord's Prayer. I think this is actually the disciples' prayer, and this is our prayer of what we are to pray. And I want to break it down for us this morning very simply as he teaches You notice, though, the very first thing is he didn't hesitate. He was quick to teach them because he wanted them to learn how to pray, and I think he wants us to learn how to pray. Now, because the camera isn't on you, is there anyone here that sometimes, maybe on occasion, finds it a struggle to pray? Anybody? 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 Great. I'm not alone. You find it hard to pray. Well, you'll be happy to know that today I want to take some of the the concern or worry out of prayer. I want to tell you by the end of the morning that prayer is simple and it's essential to the life of a believer. It is so simple. And I hope that this prayer, Jesus was teaching it to the disciples whom he knew were simple people, just like me. And he said, this is how I want you to pray. I'm going to put this on your level and I think this is going to be effective. This is simple and essential. He said, when you pray, say, the number thing he's Number one thing he says is, Father. Now, why would that be so unusual? Because in that day, they didn't understand the closeness of God, the relationship that they could have with Abba, Father, Daddy, 
loving, close, intimate relationship. Oftentimes, as we often do now, we think that God is at a distance. And Jesus was teaching, he is your father. He is close. He is telling you that you are praying to a person. And as we go through this, I just want to read a few scriptures that will tie in with the idea that Jesus is teaching in each of these areas. So that he is a person. In 1 John 3, 1, it says, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. We are his children. In 2 Corinthians 6, 18, it says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me. He's our father. So we need to know when we're praying who we are addressing. We're not addressing someone at a distance. We're addressing someone who loves us like a father. He's close. He's a person you are in relationship with, that he cares about. And I know not all of us have an experience with a loving father in the human realm. But we want you to know that God is the perfect loving heavenly father in the heavenly realm and in our hearts as we pray to him. Next part, hallowed be your name. We move from this idea of him being a person, not an object, not distant, a person, but hallowed be your name. It's a, it's, a, it's a comment of position. So he is a person, but he is a person of position. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The earth is filled with his glory. Exodus 15, 11 says, who is like you, O Lord? 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, there is none holy like the Lord. He is set apart. So as much as he is your father and that he is close, we still need to understand that there is a relational respect for this father who deeply loves us and wants to have a relationship with us. So we just stop there and say, okay, in the beginning of our prayers, can we say, can we say with all honesty that when we pray, we believe that he is close and that he loves me? Do I trust him? When I enter into this conversation with God, this prayer, do I believe that he is close and that he, he listens to my voice and that he cares about what I say and that he knows that I love him as he loves me? The next part, your kingdom come. It's this moving from a person with position, but this person with a position has a plan. It's not necessarily our plan, but it becomes our plan because we love this person of position. This plan is that his kingdom would be made manifest. The hope of all the king's heart would be made manifest as God promises his rule to continue, to continue until Jesus returns. Your kingdom come. Seek first his kingdom, it says in Matthew 6, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added or given to you as well. It's this idea that it's not our plan, it's his plan. So when now we're entering into this prayer, we understand we're speaking with a person of reverence, of holiness. We understand that it's his plan and we are part of his plan, kingdom. We talked about kingdom. What does it mean to praying or thinking or teaching about the kingdom? It's identifying who is the king. It's identifying that the kingdom has great blessing. Being part of the kingdom is full of blessing. And we understand that we have a role in the kingdom. So we understand that we have a place. It then moves on, give us each day our daily bread. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, be content with what you have. I think that's just part of our prayer. If that's all we did for a, a while, we just, God, would you teach me to be content? Would you teach me to stop striving and teach me just to be content with what you've given to me because we know that you supply me with everything that I need? We talk about his provision. Give us each day our daily bread. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. He gives me everything I need. And so we come to him and just pray, God, will you make me content with what you've given to me and what you're going to give to me to accomplish your mission that you've given to me in the kingdom? The next part, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. It's this idea of pardon, this idea of 
part in being forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we start thinking about that gift of cleanliness, holiness, forgiveness, mercy, grace, we just sit there and say, thank you for forgiving us. And we know that he is a model for forgiveness because even on the cross, Jesus, as he's being crucified, said what? Forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Even in his hardest moment, in the deepest of the wilderness, he was of forgiveness. He was all about forgiveness. I think sometime, and we'll see it later too, that we think, oh, this prayer means, well, he'll only forgive me if I forgive others. I think we read it wrong. I think we do. I think, God, we forgive others because we know how much you've already forgiven us. This isn't an if-then statement, although I think it's good for us to forgive others. I think it's for, it's for us to be contrasting the understanding that, oh, my goodness, God, you've given us so much to us. You've forgiven us so greatly. How could I not forgive others? Sometimes we feel the guilt. Oh, I can't come to him. I can't pray because I just feel so guilty because I, I haven't forgiven. No, you come into prayer so he reminds you how good it is to forgive. I think sometimes prayer is hard because we put obstacles in the way. We think that there are things that we must do to pray. We must get to a certain level in our spiritual life before we can pray. And he's saying, no, you come to me to pray so that you get to somewhere in your spiritual walk. I want to draw you in closer to me so that you become more and more like me. You come as you are. And then finally, and lead us not into temptation. It's this idea of protection. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You notice that in each of these areas, we first saw who God is, and we understand that the plan is his. It's his kingdom that is to come. We ask for provision. We ask for pardon. We ask for protection. Why? Because we want to do nothing other than his kingdom work. We want to be on mission. Don't distract us, earth around us. We come to the Father so that he will provide us for exactly what we need to accomplish the mission. We come to him so that we can be reminded that we're forgiven so that we, we, we don't get weighed down with our own guilt as we try to do what he calls us to do. And we say, will you just keep me away from any temptation, just like Jesus, your example in the wilderness. Will you just let me not be distracted from all the temptations of this world so that I can just stay on course? And he prepares us as we pray. It all starts with the Father, this perfect, loving, close, relational Father. Understand this, that God, the Father, has made himself God our Father, means that he is personally and emotionally and sacrificially, sacrificially involved with us. Like, he, he wants a personal relationship with you. He wants to be emotionally invested with you. He wants to sacrifice as he has, and he wants you to sacrifice for him. He wants this mutual love relationship. He's involved. And prayer gets us even more deeply involved with one another. And why would I not want to run to the Father and be more involved with him? I came across a quote, to know God as Father and to live our lives in harmony with him and his will is what tru it truly means to be a disciple of Christ. To know God as Father and to live our lives in harmony with him, to do the kingdom work that he has called for us to do, that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Well, that's what the Lord's Prayer is. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. That's what it's about. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's the prayer. And so we can pray that every single day of our lives and not wear it out. As Father, he loves us. He cares for us. He's always with us. He never hurts us. He is for us. He protects us and nourishes us and defends us. He helps us. He trains us. He heals us. We are his family. And we can love and worship and trust him. That's the approach that we have. He invites us to draw near to himself as God our Father. So prayer begins and ends with us understanding that God is our Father. So now he moves into the next part, and he helps us understand the necessities of our life and how they drive us to prayer. Sometimes we pray because it's 
almost like a last resort. <laughs> you're in a crisis, and you're saying, God, if you just grant me this one opportunity, I will do ABC. And he says this. Then Jesus said to them, using this analogy, which is kind of an interesting one, which has to be taught a little bit, suppose you have a friend. Suppose you have a friend. That's not too hard. Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight. That might be a little harder to fathom, but let's imagine that you're going to your friend at midnight. Why in the world would you go to your friend at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread? Would you do that? In this culture, would you knock on your friend's door at midnight and say, I need three loaves of bread? Probably not. So what would compel this person to go to someone's house and knock on their door and say, can you give me three loaves of bread? A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. Do you think that's a good enough reason? Well, why was it such a good reason in that culture? Because hospitality was a big deal. And the way you honored your, your, your guests was a big deal. And whether they came to you in the middle of the day or in the middle of the night, it was a big deal that you met their needs. That was your mission. And so that was so important that when this person didn't have what they needed to accomplish the job of hospitality at this moment, they said, I can't supply for the need, but I know who can. So I'm going to go to that person that I think can supply that need. Now, he doesn't really think a whole lot about the fact that the guy is probably sleeping with his entire family. Let's go into that. The door, don't bother me. <laughs> That's what the person inside answers. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed, and I can't give, get up and give you anything. Now, in this idea, there are two thoughts. One is either everyone's sleeping in the same bed or all the beds were in the same room, which in Jewish culture at that time probably was more the case. All the beds were in, there's like one bedroom. And so once they go down to sleep, you can just imagine at the middle of the night, you just got your two-year-old to sleep or your one-year-old or your baby, and you just got them down, and you're thinking, like, the last thing I need is someone knocking on that door right now. Because not only do I have to deal with you, I got to deal with all these eyes that are looking at me. Or maybe the animals are still there, and they start bleeding and braying. That's, you know, he's just, this neighbor is now going, all the problems that could happen if I have to respond to you. It's the middle of the night. Why are you bothering me? Why do I have to meet your need? And it goes on and says, I can't meet your need. But Jesus goes on in the parable, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Which leaves us thinking that if I just go to God and I just bother him enough, he'll give me what I need. I also think when we teach these parables that we often think that we're one person and God is another in this story. So I think we can figure out who we are. We're the ones that knock in the middle of the night, begging for things that we need that we don't have. And we would be then led to believe that God must then be the grumpy old neighbor. And that's not the case. God is not a grumpy, nasty neighbor that says, please go away. This is a parable of contrast, not comparison. This isn't saying God is like the neighbor. He's saying that if that grumpy neighbor in the middle of the night would get up because of your shameless audacity, your boldness, your willingness to say, no matter what, I need to accomplish the mission. I believe that you have what I need. I'm coming no matter what. If it's the middle of the night or anything, I'm coming. I'm coming. If that guy will give you what you need, just imagine how much more God will give you what you need. Because he wants you to come to him at any time, day or night. He has everything you need, fully supplied. He loves it when you come to him, when you have a need. He loves it. He says, come to me. So let's not misunderstand this parable to think that, oh, if I just bother Jesus, or sorry, bother God enough with my prayer, that, that he'll just answer and give it to me because I exhaust him. No, he he wants us to know that even if that person will give to you what you need, that God is so much greater. He's so much more willing. He's so much a, more of a supplier for our need than that neighbor ever could. And the focus is on this person, that we come to, we come to him. And in the next part, it says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. We, we know that Jesus himself was teaching at different times about asking and seeking. You know, he says in the scriptures, he came to seek and save the lost. He's all about seeking. And he knocks on the door, 
of hearts, as it says in Revelation. And just if you'll just respond, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. For us, he desires that we just persistently ask and seek and knock, that there would be a, in this, this continual, repeated approach before God, a time of refining, however, a time of refining because oftentimes when we come and we ask and we seek and we knock, we don't necessarily get what we want sometimes. Do you ever feel that? Or we feel like he's just not giving it to us in our time or, or that he's giving it to us in the way that we want. The reason we sometimes come to pray is so that we could be refined. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in us. He just refines us and refines us and allows us as he becomes more and more part of our thought process in that, that the results in the end are beautifully answered prayers with this process of sanctification happening all the way through. So in the same way, we go from the lesser to the greater. We see that this friend supplied for a needy neighbor who wanted the bread. We're moving into a part where we will now see the father giving a son what they need. And God wants us to know that above all of those things, I will supply for your need greater than all of those. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, I mean, he's just making a statement that we are sinful people. We're broken people. We're not perfect like he is. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask him? I, I, you know, I have four children. And in the raising of our children, I can guarantee you that there are things that I've given to my children that I probably shouldn't have. There are times when I probably was asked for, you know, the simple things like, bread and egg and fish, and I gave them a scorpion or a snake, in essence. I gave them what they didn't need. And there are other times when they probably asked for something that they, that they wanted that I didn't give to them. Like, there, there are times when I just, I, I, I'm not a perfect father. Sometimes I just don't know what to give, and sometimes I feel like I don't have it, or maybe I shouldn't give it, and I wrestle through that back and forth, but God is not like that. He knows exactly what we need. He, he knows exactly how to give good gifts. And in the, chapter, uh, uh, in the chapters aligning with this in the book of Matthew that also teaches about the Lord's Prayer, it would respond, and which is why I paused and wrote over them. It said here, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? That's what it says in the book of Matthew. But I like what it says here. I like what it says here. It says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And I think that that's because when we ask with shameless audacity, a boldness that persists over time, we ask for, for instance, strength. He doesn't just give us strength. He gives us the Holy Spirit who is omnipotent. He gives us the Holy Spirit that is capital S, strength. When we ask for peace, he gives us the spirit of peace. He doesn't just give us a good gift. He gives us himself. He gives us a greater gift, the greatest gift, the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and to fill us and to lead us and to guide us. He just doesn't give us guidance. He gives us the guide. He doesn't just give us counseling. He gives us the counselor. He doesn't just give us comfort. He gives us the comforter. He doesn't just give us a one-time spiritual experience. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And God, we pray that your spirit in us would send us and lead us and guide us wherever you desire. Your kingdom come. Father, hallowed be your name. Blessings of your kingdom are present and are abundant, and they are worth sharing with others. And then we ask as his servants, what can I do for you? What would you have me do? The more we pray, the more the Holy Spirit shapes us to understand that God is our loving, heavenly Father. So have we, have we understood that it's fairly simple? that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we understand that we are praying to a person of position who has a plan that his kingdom come. And then we ask so that we don't get strayed from the mission. We ask for his provision. We ask for his pardon to be revealed to us so that we understand the mercy and love and forgiveness of God so that we would forgive others. That we would understand that he is our protector, that he can provide for us when we are in those moments of temptation. That we would certainly ask, Lord, what would you have me do? Why? Because we want to come and do his will. It's about the kingdom. 
So the problem about prayer is that it means that we want to and desire to put the kingdom needs before our own needs. And that's probably the hardest thing about prayer. Because prayer is a time when we walk in and we say, Father, I just want to stop what I'm doing. And I want to be with you so that I can see what you're doing. See what you've done and how you're at work. And I pray that you'll do a work in me. That's what prayer is. And so for the next few minutes, I just thought as we close today, we would just pray the Lord's Prayer. I want to read it. I want you to silently read it. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Now I want us to make it our prayer. Can you read this with me? And if you feel like you are a follower of Christ, or you can just say it for the sake of saying it, but I, for those of you who are believers, I hope that you will read this and you will start to let this sink in and let this be our prayer. Can we just read this together? Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. We're just going to move into a time, and I'm just going to take each of these pieces, and you're just going to pray them silently in your heart and allow the Spirit to do His molding work in you. Let me just pray before we do that. Father, would you just come even now? We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. You love us. And that in this moment, you want us to be like those disciples when they ask, teach us how to pray. Will you teach us even now how to pray? Even though we've heard this prayer before, I pray that it will mean even more as we read it today, as we think about it, and as we carry it with us as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I'm just going to take about a minute for each of these as we close today. And I just want us to think about, as we start, praying that first word, Father. Let's just, and if you just want to close your eyes, that's why sometimes we just tune out everything that's around us to focus on each of these phrases. Father, what is he speaking to you? Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread.
Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Amen. My hope is that as you ask and you seek and you knock, even in the difficult times and in your daily life, that you will understand that you are approaching a Father who loves it when you do and that he has the beyond your mind capability to supply for your needs. This prayer is simple. I pray that you will memorize it, repeat it, take it to heart, and that you will use it as a guide because Jesus thought it was good enough to teach his disciples and we are his disciples too. I think it puts us in a good posture. It reveals things to us through his spirit about how it is we are to live. And so to close today, James, we're going to do the Revelation song, and we'll invite you to stand.